Okay, so so and that's the rest of we didn't get through all of the notes yesterday. Um when we know um that the population is normal and we know sigma, we know the population standard deviation, we can use the z distribution. Okay? Now, we can also use the z distribution if we know the population standard deviation or sigma and our sample size is bigger than 30, both sample sizes are bigger than 30, without being told that the population is normal, okay? The T distribution gets used when we do not know the population standard deviation. All right, so when samples are large, okay, Okay, it says when samples are large in this type of interval, it is valid to use the sample standard deviation in place of the population standard deviations. Okay, we talked about that yesterday at the end. Okay, it is appropriate and accurate to use the student's key distribution whenever sigma from both population, that's the standard deviation of the population, okay, when they are unknown. That is the exact same thing that we stated back when we were looking at all of these. So these are the different um, confidence intervals that we've investigated so far in this chapter. Okay, this one here is the standard DV or the, the confidence interval um, when we're looking for means and we know the population standard deviation. Okay, that was the first one we went through. Okay, this is the exact same thing but this is when we don't know the population standard deviation. So what takes place is you interchange sigma, which is the population standard deviation up here, with the sample standard deviation. That's, a, that's an easy um, interchange or an acceptable interchange. Population standard deviation replaced with sample standard deviation. But because of that, then the T distribution needs to be used because that is more appropriate than the Z distribution. So when we use the T distribution, we have to know a degrees of freedom. And when we did it for the mean, we're trying to find the confidence interval for the mean, the degrees of freedom was n minus one. It was one less than the sample size, okay? Now, when we're talking about the um, T distribution with um, the difference between means here, okay, population means, this, and I'm not gonna read all this to you. Um, there's a formula, it's called Satterwhite's uh, approximation. This is the best way, or one of the best ways, uh, to find our degrees of freedom for this problem. That's pretty messy, yes? Okay. Um, what we find, that, that, like I said, that's the best approximation, but what works equivalently, okay, um, it's not as great as the approximation, but it's to take your two sample sizes, and whichever one is the smallest, you're going to subtract one from it, and that becomes your degree of freedom. Does that make sense? Okay. The formula for finding the confidence interval is identical to what it was previously, except for when finding E, this is T instead of Z. Okay, so it tells us to use the T uh, distribution to find that um, value, that T score. And instead of sigma, these are... S, which refers to the sample variance or the sample standard deviation, how you want to view it, okay? So we'll go through a problem here um, using that. Um, see if I've got one here where we've got... That's all this data uh, to save a little bit of time, but it's, it's our, I've already got it all processed here. Okay, so we'll do this example. Um, Ms. Alexander Borbley is a professor in the uh, Medical School of University of Zurich, uh, where he is the director of the sleep laboratory. Um, his colleagues are experts on sleep dreams and sleep disorders. In his book, Secrets of Sleep, Dr. Uh, Borbley discusses brain waves, which are measured in hertz, okay, the number of oscillations per second. So it's rapid brain wa waves, which they call wakefulness, are in the range of 16 to 25 hertz. Slow brain waves, which is our sleep, uh, are in range of 4 to 8 hertz. So during normal sleep, a person goes through several cycles. Each cycle is about 90 minutes of brain waves from rapid to slow and back to rapid. During deep sleep, brain waves are at their slowest. In the book, uh, the professor comments that alcohol is a poor sleep aid. 
In one study, a number of subjects were given half a liter of red wine before they went to sleep. The subjects fell asleep quickly but did not remain asleep the entire night. Toward morning between 4 and 6, they tended to wake up and have trouble going back to sleep. So suppose that a random sample of 29 college students were randomly divided into two groups. The first group, 15 people, uh, was given half a liter of red wine before they went to sleep. The second group, 14 people, were given no alcohol before going to sleep. Everyone in both groups went to sleep at 11 p.m. The average brain activity um, from 4 to 6 a.m. was determined for each individual in the groups, and these are the results. Okay? So basically what they're trying to say is we have this idea or thought, this hypothesis that uh, they're going to, that by drinking the alcohol, they wake up early and can't go back to sleep. They don't get as much rest as somebody without it. Okay, so they took and monitored brain waves uh, for both groups. Okay, so this is our control group, no alcohol, and this is our treatment group with alcohol, right? And we record their brain activity, and then we can make a decision here in a moment that's going to allow us to decide, yes, our thought was true, or no, our thought was, um, we don't have information to support it. Okay, um, so because... We don't know, as we go through this, we do not know the population standard deviation, okay? We do not know, um, obviously, the population of people that go to sleep with a half a liter of alcohol in their system. We don't know that population. Does that make sense? So we don't know that standard deviation. So in that instance, then, we are going to look at uh, using X bar minus Y bar, Minus E is less than mu1 minus mu2 less than X bar minus Y bar plus E. But because we do not know population standard deviation from the first population and the population standard deviation for the second population, we're going to use a T distribution. Okay. T distribution must be utilized. So in that instance, when we use the T distribution, okay, E is going to be T sub alpha over 2. Okay. Then we're going to have the square root. It'll be Sample standard deviation squared over that sample size plus the sample standard deviation squared of the second sample divided by its size. That's the same formula as we were using with Z, except for that number right there. Okay? And we've talked about how that we can interchange population standard deviations and sample standard devi deviations um, easily. Okay? So, what we want here... Is, I think I say down here, do I tell you what? I'm not sure which. I don't know if in the problem it said what. It's confidence level I'm looking at here. All right, so I, I don't put a confidence level in here. I, I've done it already previously. I'm, I'm going to guess that I said 95%. Um, that might be incorrect. But let's do a confidence level. Of 95 percent okay so we need to be able to use T so T okay if we go to any one of our tools Excel or Desmos whatever it may be it's going to need a degree of freedom okay so I'm going to type in uh, T dot INV Okay, and says it returns the left-tailed inverse of the student T distribution, and that's what we want. Okay, so but I'm reminding myself that it returns the left tail. Okay, and now it says probability and then degree of freedom. So probability is in this case because our alpha is going to be five percent in the T distribution, the alpha gets cut in half. So we're going to look at point zero two five. Does that make sense? That's the probability that we're interested in here. Okay, so I'm going to zero two five, and now it asks for degrees of freedom. Okay, now we could use, like I said, 
this monster right here. Okay? And what we would find out, we have all that information. We have M, which is the sample size of the first population or first sample. We have N, sample size of the second uh, sample. We have S sub 1, and we have S sub 2. We have all this stuff. Okay? Um, and, and if we had time, I don't think we're going to have time today, uh, we could compute this and see that going through that calculation, it's going to be okay to use one of these instead. They're going to be close enough. Does that make sense? Okay. This will give me a better interval. Okay. This will give me um, a more compact interval. Okay. This is going to give me like a conservative interval. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so it's going to be a little bit wider than what this would produce. But it's, the wi wider is safer for us. Does that make sense? Okay, in, in regards to confidence. So, if I look at my two value, to my sample sizes, okay, now they're calling it N1 and N, N sub 1 and N sub 2, but this, we call this M, and we can call this N. Uh, which one of those is smaller, 15 or 14? 14? 14. So then we subtract 1 from that, and that's our degree of three, freedom. So 13 is going to be what we type in here for our degree of freedom. And we'll type, so negative 2.16, okay? Now, I'm not going to use the negative part of that. Does that make sense? That's the, because the, the negative part is uh, going to show up ultimately when we subtract the error here, and the positive version of that 2.16 number will be uh, displayed here when we add E, okay? So I'm always going to use ultimately the absolute value of this, okay? So 2.16. <clears throat> so then plugging that stuff in, so E is going to be 2.16. Okay, now this is the standard deviation of the first sample. Well, if we go through here, it says for group one, we have the sample mean and standard deviation of this right there. So this was the raw data, okay? And if I didn't, have this already listed for us, we would have had to go to Excel, type that raw data in, and ask it to find the sample standard deviation or the sample variance. They give it to us here. Okay, so I'm going to put 1.86 squared. Okay, and we're going to divide that by M, which is the sample size, so 15. Plus, and now we're going to go to the other group, the other sample. And we have that standard deviation for that sample, 1.91 squared. And then 14 is the size of that sample. Is that okay? Okay. Now, group one, and this is, I, I just think this is the best thing to do. I go, I go alphabetical. I'm going to let group one be my X variable, group two be my Y variable. Okay, so when I go X bar minus Y bar, when I go sample mean minus sample mean, okay, it's going to be 19.65 minus 6.59. Is that okay there, everybody? Okay. Um, so then we're going to, once we have all this written down, it's just a matter of figuring out what this calculates to, what this calculates to, and then plugging those things into this interval. Okay, so I'm just going to grab Excel or Desmos, it doesn't matter. Use Desmos, it's easier to type in. I'll make this bigger in a minute.
All right, so typing those two values in or those two um, quantities, we get these back. Okay. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to take X bar minus Y bar, which I've identified here as that M, and we're going to subtract the error from it, and I get that number. You know, I want to add the error to it, and I get that number. It's 11.54 and 14.57, okay? Um, which I just want to take a quick glance. Okay, so I must have used a different... You see those are different right here, 11.8 and 14.3. A um, little bit different. Um, I'm going to use a different confidence interval uh, when I, when I pre-wrote these notes, okay? Yes, please. Well, hold on a second. Um, so now that we've got that, okay, those uh, and this is what we're I'm, I'm mostly interested in. So these are these are okay approximations of what I had. I don't, I don't really too much care about the interval right now. Um, but what is that kind of number right there? Positive. What is this number over here? Positive. So what's that tell me that, that has to be? Positive. Okay. So then that tells me that the population sub one here, okay, which was this first group, right? That was the people that were drinking the alcohol, correct? They have a greater population mean than what mu sub two does, okay? Which, what were we measuring here? Brain activity from four to six. So they've got, what we're saying here is that they've got more brain activity, they've got more wakefulness in this case, than what this group does. Does that make sense? So we have shown, in this case, 95% confidence that this is true. Okay? Uh, that his, his assumption right here, uh, his, we'll call it a hypothesis, um, is validated by this, this study. Okay? Um, Just cut this out. The zooming on this is, I can't get the whole question, kind of pain in the butt for you guys to see, but um, kind of scroll through this a little bit. Uh, it says, researchers investigated the speed uh, with which consumers decide to purchase a product. The researchers theorized that consumers with last names that begin with letters uh, later in the alphabet will tend to acquire items faster than those with last names that begin with letters earlier in the alphabet. Called the last name effect. MBA students were offered tickets to a, base, a basketball game the first letter of the last name of the respondents and the response times were noted. The researchers compared the response times for two groups. Uh, one group, those with last names beginning with the letters A through I, and the second group with letters R to Z. So summary statistics for the two groups are provided in the accompanying table, uh, complete parts A and B. All right, so your table looks like this. Let me cut this out. So that's what your table looks like, okay? Um, so we want to see, is there a difference in response times, okay? Um, so when we go, it's going to be X bar minus Y bar minus E, less than mu1 minus mu2, less than X bar minus Y bar plus E, right? Okay? Um, now, we've got everything we need here. It's already processed. So what I'm going to do is just kind of take the, uh, the information that I have here and just replace it with what's coming up from this problem. Does that make sense? And that's what you guys can do. Once you, once you do this problem once and you have something built in Excel or built in uh, Desmos that helped you evaluate that first problem, doing a second problem is the same thing. You've got to replace these numbers. Okay? So my standard deviation for one of these is 8.02 and the sample size for that is 25 sample standard deviation of the other one is 8.36 and sample size is 
again, 25. Okay. Now, the only thing that I've got to be cautious of is that 2.16. That 2.16 is not the correct value here, okay, because we want um, a 95% confidence interval, okay, and now degrees of freedom, if these are the same, then it's just going to be 24. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to go type in, okay, it was 95% confidence, so this is going to be 0 0.025, and then we want 24 for degrees of freedom, so 2.06. 389, okay? Um, the more of that number that you use, decimal-wise, obviously the better. So we'll go 2.06, uh, I'm just going to round it to 4, okay? So there is my error. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Now, we are going to look at uh, subtracting the mean times. So 20.02 minus 14.48. And we do that. Then that's turning out to give me this here, which if we look at yours, it's giving me the 0.88 And 10 points. So we're in the ballpark. Let me see if we click on your answers. What it is doing is giving me, uh, it's not going to change it, 0 0.02. It provides, so our, so what, what do we recognize? Ours is a little bit uh, different than what they are showing here, correct? Okay. Uh, my my thought is the reason for that. I'll, I'll go through the help me solve this to see what Excel is, or Math Excel is doing. The reasoning I would argue is because um, how the degrees of freedom are being chosen. We're choosing this, the the smaller sample size um, and subtracting one. I wonder if these problems are using this for degrees of freedom. Okay, um, which what happens is that the, this is not, this is a bigger interval than what the answer is, okay? Um, so it's a wider interval, and this is what I was talking about earlier, so this may be a good um, scenario to see here, try to get the, why won't that show up in the background? So you see that they want 0.88 to 10.2, right? So if I was to put that on a number line, okay, maybe 0.88 is there and 10.2 is there. We just found, so that's, that's the interval that they're looking for, okay? We just found an interval that goes from like 0.72 something to uh, like 10.3 something. Does our interval contain this one? Okay, so what we did here is we used a degree of freedom that produces a more um, or a lengthier or more robust confidence level, which tells me then that I've probably got, we said 95% confidence, we're being conservative, okay? Um, it will create a, a interval that will be a little bit bigger than this one, and it's okay, okay? Uh, but let me see. I'm going to go through real quick and see if I can. All right, so, and then this is, this is just something that we, we have to understand how some textbooks are, the author is saying, okay, we want to use this sadder weight uh, formula. Some textbooks will say, well, an approximation will be good enough by using M minus 1 or N minus 1, depending on which one's smaller. 
another option, okay, is to use a degree of freedom that is n plus m minus 2, okay? If we do that, so that would be our, our n and m were both 25, subtract 2 from would be 48. If we plug 48 into our t inverse as our degrees of freedom, 48, okay? Gives me that number there. If I interchange that number for my t score, okay? See how that then fixes these to 0.88 and 10.2, okay? I am not worried about the, the procedure in this, and, and to, I'm not going to give you one of these tomorrow, okay? Um, but I want us to be able to say, okay, once we get down to this here, okay, can I make a conclusion about mu1 and mu2? Okay, that's really the goal. Either way that I use the confidence interval, no matter what I use that 2.01 number, I think there's a, like a 2.01. 06 number was the first one I used. Regardless, they're both going to produce the same result, right, from U1 and U2, okay? Whether I use, um, I guess in your guys' problem, it was the, the 0.7 number to 10.3 or 0.8 to 10.2, they're both still positive, so U1 is still going to be um, less than U2, okay? Or I guess U1 would be greater than U2 in that one. Does that answer your question? You see the, the issue there? And that, that's as we go through statistics, guys, because these are ultimately approximations that when we, we, we have different approaches that are acceptable, um, it's just what it is. Okay? There's, there's no like, concrete, say, so got to do it this way. There's, there's different approximations for what our degrees of freedom could be. Um, some are better than others. It's just when you when you were to do a like if you were going to do this research, you would write out and explain using the the, the student t distribution with degrees of freedom, whatever you may choose, and explain why then you're choosing that degree of freedom. Okay, so you you explain to the observers or the audience um, your rationale for those those decisions. I understand the confusion and then the frustration that might occur on that assignment because of that one. Um, I want you to do the assignment, but if that's confusing, don't worry about it impacting your grade. Does that make sense? Okay. Expose yourself to the, to the assignment, finish the assignment, um, but I'll take in consideration when I go back and grade them um, about that fluctuation between that T value. Yes, please. Did you hit enter? Have you guys look at, and I can send this to you. This here is kind of a breakdown of the five different confidence intervals that we've been working on since beginning of February. Okay. Um, simplest of the Five is finding the confidence interval for the, the population mean, okay? Now, when I, when I do this and I come over here and I say that my error is Z sub alpha over 2 times sigma over root N, okay? Sigma is population standard deviation. N is sample size. I can use that one when sigma is known, okay? This is 8.1 information, okay? In order to find Z sub alpha or two, I got to use the norm in, norm dot inverse on Excel. Uh, if you're going to use decimals, it's a, it's a complex um, command on Desmos. Uh, but if you scour through like the 8.1, 8.2 videos, uh, somewhere in there, I explain how to do that. Okay, and we talked about it in class. Um, you need to be told that the population is normal to be able to use this, or you need to have your sample size bigger than or equal to 30. Okay, that, that's kind of the conditions that were required for this. 
Okay. Now, if you did not know, if you did not know the population standard deviation, the process is exactly the same, but you interchange the population standard deviation with the sample standard deviation. That's where we're seeing right here this S being replaced or replacing sigma. Okay. And the Z score gets replaced with a T score. Okay. Degrees of freedom will be one less than your sample size. Okay. And you use that when you do not know the population standard deviation. The command on Excel is that you're going to use the T.INV. Okay. And if you're on Excel and I've seen, I've shown this, it's kind of hard to see because even if I zoom in, it, it still doesn't change the, the size of this box right here. But that, if I just type that in, this box right here explains what this command is going to return. It says returns the left-tailed inverse of the student's T distribution. Okay? So if we know what left tail looks like visually to us, we're thinking now it's returning that value right there. Okay? That's the left tail. Does that make sense? Okay, the student T distribution. When I hit parenthesis, it tells me probability. Well, probability is the area that is in that left tail. Okay, and that's all going to be, that's alpha over 2, right? Okay, and then you can see that it asks for degrees of freedom after that. Okay, so as you're using Excel, that's what I like about Excel is because on a test or a quiz, if I forget what those commands should be, what order and all that kind of stuff, it tells me. All right, but I got I to gotta understand what left-tailed means, and I got to understand when it says probability. That's talking about alpha over 2 there, the, probably the area of that left tail. Um, but you use that when you do not know the population standard deviation. Okay, but if you don't know the population standard deviation, you will know the sample standard deviation. Okay, and if you look back then at the confidence interval, that confidence interval right there is exactly the same thing, right? Okay, except for the way E was developed in both of them. Okay. Then in 8.3, we got to the population proportions. Okay. Uh, so we talked about, like, poles and stuff like that. Um, P hat minus E is less than P is less than P hat plus E. In this case, that's how I'm going to find my error. Okay. Population proportions. Okay, it's, just, it's, it's essentially like basic probability. Okay, if I've got 200 people and um, 30 of them are left-handed and I want to know what's the population proportion of left-handed people, it's 30 out of 200. Okay, numerator is number of successes, denominator is total number of possible outcomes. Okay, so X over N is how I find P hat out of my sample. Q hat is 1 minus P hat, they're complements. Uh, again, we're using a z-score, so we're going to use the norm.inv command just like we did up here, okay? So if you're using a, a interval that requires z distribution, it's always norm.n inverse uh, or inv. And if you're using a student t distribution, it's always t.inverse, okay? Um, the one thing that has to be true Okay, is that n times p hat has got to be greater than 5, greater or equal 5, and n times q hat has to be greater or equal 5. And the reason we do that is because of the binomial aspect of um, the situation. Okay, if, if I'm looking at a population proportion, I can't be left-handed and be right-handed. Okay, I, you do have ambidextrous people, but one of them, if, if you're ambidextrous, you are better with one of those hands, right? Therefore, you would be considered right-handed if you're better with your right hand or left with your left hand. Okay with everybody? So you can all, they're essentially independent outcomes. Um, because of that, then, we can be guaranteed normality, which then if we're guaranteed normality, that tells us that we can use this Z distribution. Okay? Um, which those are little things. Those, those are the kinds of questions that I'll ask that will, like, bolster the amount of questions in the assignment, the, 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 the test that you won't do a calculation with. Does that make sense? You'll read it. This is a, um, a content question in, in regards to uh, or in comparison to a, a calculation question, actually finding the confidence intervals. Um, 
Here's your chi-square stuff. Okay, remember, I, I think this is the best way to find your chi-squared values. Okay, this is going to give you your chi-squared left, and this will give you your chi-squared right. All right, um, we use that for uh, finding the, the interval for variance or standard deviation if we want to take the square root of everything then. You must be told the population is normal in order to do that. Okay. And then the last one, we just talked about the difference between the means, um, again, using norm inverse. I would, the things that we talked about today with the student key distribution, I'm not going to give you one of those on the test just because of the degree of freedom issue that we realized today. Okay. Um, if I give you a difference of means on the test, it will incorporate the Z distribution. Okay, you will know the population standard deviations. Keaton, question? Say it again. Yes, alpha over two. Yep, yep, yep. I will. I'll send that. Would you guys be okay if I send that to you? Uh, now, when I send, I don't know how it'll send because it'll it'll send in one note. Um, if you open it and like it didn't come through the way you think it should, email me and I'll, uh, I'll try to fix it and send it back. Okay. Um, but before I, I guess before I send it through one, I'll see if I can like export it as a PDF. I might be able to do that.